thanks to our German heritage. Uh, so we'll go ahead and turn the time over to her and let her do whatever she wants to for the next uh, two minutes or half an hour. <laughs> pay attention, please. She knew she didn't have enough to pay for the food on the cruise. So every day she went to her room and ate her crackers and cheese during mealtime. And finally the last day came and the captain saw her and he said, Mrs. So-and-so, we have missed you. You've not been with us on at mealtime. And she said, well, I didn't have enough to pay for my meals. I just had enough to pay for the cruise. And he said, well, Mrs. So-and-so, the food came with the cruise. <laughs>
some of us more than others. Yes. Anyway, I think that's something we look forward to. Uh, now, actually, I, I've asked Gretchen to just say a few things about Ellis Island. She was there recently, and that's where uh, Ernest and, and, uh, and Gretchen, Charlotte, and Henry came to. Well, I told this at the get together in the summertime, but those of you that weren't here might remember. About a year ago, my husband was able to go to New York City to teach some seminars, and he invited me to go along. And I was thrilled because I got I wanted to go to Ellis Island. That was my main reason for to go to New York. I was so excited because I heard stories about Ellis Island. And I just really wanted to go there. We wanted to go there on Sunday, but the, um, oh, we didn't have time. We went to church instead, and then we were going to catch the ferry and go out to Ellis Island, but it's a, it's about a four or five hour um, experience to take the ferry out and back. So we didn't get to do that, and Monday Kevin had to teach, so I decided by myself to ride the subway to Battery Park and take the ferry out to Ellis Island, and I was all alone. It scared me to death to ride the ferry, I mean, to ride the subway. But I did it, <laughs> and it was such a... It was through a lot of prayer, and I, it was a neat experience, because I was praying in the hotel room, and I felt this strong feeling that once I step outside my hotel door, that my father would be with me, so I felt like his spirit was with me, but... Um, went out there to Ellis Island, and those of you that have been there know what a thrill it is to ride the boat and to feel those feelings that Grandma Lippert and Grandpa Lippert and Charlotte and, you know, Henry was just a baby coming over. But I had talked to Charlotte before I went over, and she, she remembers the boat ride, and she remembers that was the very first time she ever saw an orange, and she remembers her dad peeling it like a flower, peeling the it down like a flower. So it was neat and I, you go to one island and then you get back and go to the Statue of Liberty and I ran to try to find an orange somewhere but they didn't have any. But it was just a neat, neat feeling. Oh, and orange juice. But um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's okay, what was I doing? The orange, but um, Oh, and then once they come over to um, Ellis Island, they have to go through like an immigration thing. And I got this book there if you want to thumb through it. But um, Charlotte was about four years old and she had casts on her legs. And it was, you go through this museum at Ellis Island and it tells about what they went through and they really examined you before they would allow you to come into the country. and. Like, back there they showed where a nine-year-old boy, I don't know for what reasons, but his family got to stay and he was sent back to this country. And it was quite a sad thing. You know, people coming from Germany thinking, they really thought America was paved with gold and they were expecting it to be almost a heaven. And when they got here, they couldn't speak the language. Um, people, you know, they examined them and they they come into the country, so they had to turn around and go home, but and they didn't have the money, so it was really quite a sad time. And with Charlotte being in a cast, um, I think they were hoping to find out if they were accepted into America on Friday, but this office closed, and they had to wait the whole weekend before they found out that they were able to stay in America. So it was a challenging time, you know. They talked about, um, oh yeah, they... They made her, Charlotte says she remembers this big room where you go, and she remembers that they made her walk across the, to floor to see, yeah. Grandma kept telling Charlotte, you've got to walk, no matter what, you've got to walk across that floor or they won't let you into America. So, obviously she passed the test, but it was quite a challenge. And, um, I'm getting so old, I can't they would come over dressed really clean, and, but once they've been, been on the boat for so long, they got dirty, and you know it was quite a hardship. And it just—it was just a thrill to 
ride that ferry boat, seeing America and kind of thinking of what they went through, their feelings and emotions. It was quite an emotional time, I think, to do this. So I'm grateful for what they sacrificed so that we could be in America. So. I don't know how many of you, how many have been to Ellis Island? A couple of you. If you ever get back to New York, <clears throat> take the ferry. Don't get off at the Statue of Liberty. It's not worth your time. Stay on the ferry <laughs> and go over to Ellis Island and spend three or four hours. And you, you'll be in tears when you're done. It, it's, it's, a, it's really a truly an amazing place. Um, and I think you'll have a great appreciation for what our ancestors went through when they came over. Dennis and his family, next. Of my 
Grandma and Grandpa robbed us, and they wrote back and said, we do, and we'll make a copy for you and send it to you. She was so excited, wrote back to them and said, if you'll do that, I'll write all the Robbins genealogy. It goes back to 1400. She sent her letter, it just took her forever to write this by hand. They didn't have computers that David uses, it wasn't you know, it was easy. So she prepared all that, sent it back to them, they sent her the picture that uh, she still has. And then she said, um, um, the 14th century is a long ways back for you, your great-great-grandparents, you'll have a long genealogy. I wonder how many of those whose work is done in the temple will, will accept the gospel. Some say we will know. In the meantime, we must do our best here. And most of her letters she wrote, she always said, we must do our best here. It's kind of a phrase that she used a lot. You boys have a lot, have a big job to do. So I think she's talking about David and Wes and Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> you boys have a big job to do. There are so many that have not heard of the gospel yet. God bless you, Grandpa and Grandma. And then she put one of his quotes in the letter at the end. We think ourselves masters when we are only stewards and forget to each, that to each of us it will one day be said, give an account of thy stewardship. So she always was kind of jabbing me, you know, all these little quotes. I'll read one more thought that she gave that I thought was interesting that I'd forgotten about. And that is, on my way back from my mission, we wanted to stop in Germany, and it was during the winter. So she wrote about some of her memories in Germany and what it was like around Christmas time. And she said, but it's very, very cold there, so make sure you take some cold. And stay warm. And if you get through, if you go through Bavaria, you'll have to stop in the city of Ulm, because in this city, in this museum, there are two great pieces of art that you'll want to see. One is a painting from your second great granduncle Ludwig Travis, and an engraved moon calendar from your second great grandfather Jacob Travis. He said it'd be worth. She said it'd be worth seeing if you are close by, but don't go that way unless you have warm clothes. It certainly wouldn't be worth it. Well, it would be worth it. I didn't go there. I wish I would have. But I don't know if anybody else there is from Bavaria, but we ought to look that up and see. And then again, at the end of her letter, she gave this uh, other thought. The secret of happiness is not in doing what one likes, but in liking what one has to do, by Bruce Barton. I, I always appreciated Grandma. She just seemed to have a common sense about her, and, and uh, was easy to talk to, and we just shared stories. Are we all here yet? Yeah. yeah. Well, you're you're through Ab Libby. Okay. I'm going to tell him one more thing, then I'll get off in front of the stage. As you know, I lived there until I was about three and a half while Dad was in the Army. And I remember her telling stories to me. There was one that was a favorite story that I'd asked her to tell me over and over again. And she eventually typed it up and sent a copy to all the grandchildren. But I don't know if you have a copy or not. It was called Happy Journey to Dreamland. And um, I won't tell the whole story except just the point that she made that I didn't realize at the time. But this little boy goes into his bedroom and the grandma comes in and tells a story and first he has to kneel down and say his prayers. He's obedient because he follows his grandmother. I mean all these things that she was telling in the story was exactly for me I'm sure. And then this fairy comes to him during this dream called Goodwill. And the dream is a dream of, of where this fairy takes this little boy and his sister, and they go from place to place doing good to others. I mean, this is a calculated story here to teach a principle. And then, after going through all these experiences of being kind to others, he wakes up and tells his mother about this dream and says, I'm going to be good to everybody all the time. That's kind of the end of the story. So I thought that was kind of a fun thing that uh, she wrote, prepared, and if you like the story, I'll make you copy. We're going to sing a, so a song that uh, Mom wrote uh, years ago, the tune, It's a Small World. It's been kind of fun to sing over the years. If you want to join us in the last verse, I think you know the words by now, but we're going to try it another time. Last one.
Tag. Tag. Uh, du bist ein Deutschmark.
build as we watch this. And, uh, and at that point, you, you, you ask yourself, did he brush or dip? And then when you find out, of course, this is the Grand Poupa Ball Climaxes in theater. At that point, you can clap or, or, or if you're a cowboy, you say, hot, hot dang. <laughs> or maybe you're just speechless, you can go, woo, woo. That'd be okay. So we'd like to be an actor. Margaret Lippert, who was Grandma Lippert, 
ask that I speak this afternoon, I accept it willingly because I have known Sister Brooks all my life from childhood up, and the feeling I had for her was the very best. She was always kind, sincere, and humble, and ready and willing to do her duty at all times. She led an honorable and righteous life. I ask her loved ones that she leaves behind this afternoon to remember that she remained true and they can in no greater way honor their mother than to remain true. In conclusion, I would like to read a poem written by her daughter Margaret, her grandma. This poem depicts in a very sincere way the sentiments that I'd like to leave with you. Mother, little mother of mine, how I will miss you. You were always kind and true. It was you who in, my, who in my tender youth taught me the ways of right and truth. You who guided my footsteps aright and washed me over me day and night. You who brought me to this glorious land where God's holy temple stands. Hardships and trials came your way, but you were willing to conquer and stay. Now that your work, work on earth is completed, for this body for a time will have more need. Now that you have met your maker face to face, receiving his tender mercy and grace, somehow I know, precious mother of mine, untold blessings and eternal joy are thine. Gretchen Margaret Whitmer. Bishop Leo Jardine also spoke at that funeral, and he had just a little comment to say here that I'd like to pass on, because this helps us get to understand who we really are. When I think of Sister Brooks, I have gleaned from the conversations with her and her family being raised in Rolandstadt, Germany, where they had to leave their homes, their family, and their possessions. What it must have meant to be ostracized by friends and relatives who have joined the church, and what it meant to come to a new land. I realize what strength and character she had. My faith is also strengthened when I think that she had enough faith to come here to a new land where she knew no one. And when I think of the times I have visited her there in Brother and Sister Lipper's home, and the way she would talk to them and tell me of her life and how the tears would well up in her eyes, you could see she was overflowing with faith. Even though her health was not good, as she always had a smile on her face when I went to see her. That was something that would give me inspiration to continue on, my, uh, continue on with my problems. Because as someone who had gone through the experience that she had to go through, and could still smile and still have such faith that she had done the right thing, that I was assured that I should also continue on. The family requested that I say a few words and give me a short poem that they would like to have me read. And I think that it portrays in a very splendid way for her, in her case, and the case of many others. You don't see many of us taken into our homes, immigrants who have immigrated here. Brother Reynolds just whispered to me that he had the opportunity of meeting her at the train with her little family and making her welcome here and taking her to his home. I wonder if we are losing some of the fine things in our church when our parents had the opportunity of taking someone in who had left all that they had had to come here with nothing. I think possibly that we're all hurry through life now until we are losing many of the things that our parents had the privilege of enjoying. As I said, this is a little poem given to me by Sister Lip. She was no pioneer. She did not share the companionship and the singing on the plains. Nor she, did she know the substance of prayer offered about a campfire. There remains. No mark of where she passed through for all she wrought. My mother came and immigrated alone. A stranger in an alien land she brought. Her, only her faith to bridge the great unknown. Her courage and that of many of her kind has gone unsung and yet I see it now. I shed a tear for the love when she left behind, for she all sacrificed and bore. I bow my head in reverence for the dream she caught, for my own faith through her so dearly brought. had a request to change some of the order of our program and that is uh, invite other people who are not on the program to participate at this time kind of as a break and then we'll continue through with the rest of them. Uh, I know that uh, Heather has a presentation you'd like to make and uh, are there any other people who are not on the, the list that, do have, that have prepared something so we can get you on at this time? Scott, don't you have a dance? Oh, you're later. I'm sorry. Anyone else? Volunteers? Okay. Uh, 
Uh, Heather, could you introduce yourself first of all? Okay, okay, you're on. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Carl. I am well, my uh, Ann, Ann Nelson is the proud mother of me. <laughs> and, um, Heather here is, is my girlfriend, and the both of us we both served in Berlin, Germany, on our missions, and so she's going to sing for us a, a, a German folk song.
ocean had encountered icebergs ro roaming or ramming, I don't know, a large one and promptly sank. I guess they rammed it. When we reached the spot where the ship had gone down, icebergs were still all around and the captain decided to anchor in mid-ocean. It gave all the passengers a funny feeling when all the machinery stopped dead still. In other words, the heartbeat of the ship stopped. The foghorn blew every 20 minutes, day and night. Does anybody know why they did that? Richard thought they were trying to scare away the icebergs. <laughs> <laughs>
get to know you and, and what you're doing. I I wanted my children to get to know you better. My children have over 80 grand, 80 cousins, and I don't know how many second cousins. And this is a wonderful blessing, and I want them to have this opportunity. So I worked a lot of overtime to get us all out here this year. And I'm really grateful for this, and, and uh, I'm going to make every effort to be here every year at all possible. in front of the camera.
So he was very concerned because when you can't get like, you can't get through a town just a few miles away from her, covered by a mudslide and people got killed. And he, you know, we have few concerns over our health, our prayers. Of course, she was brought home safe and with a great experience, and we're grateful for that. And, and then the little thing, my wife told me I can't. Following this 
She also said she wanted us to remember and his sacrifice. And that kind of realize what he has gone through. You know, I've, I've never quite as teammate, but a great deal of uh, him for the sacrifice he made in, in transplanting. Cheery, I'm excited to talk about rules. Did something to it. Uh, I want to make, make comments. The closing one tonight. I mean, the neighbor dressed a lot better than I. But also, he helped put Kyle Floor here. Uh, with uh, Carl Mueller and helped help with this. So, um, also, if you haven't paid yet, I still need to. Before you leave, man. I'd like to thank everyone that got put some extra into that. I personally know who's been here tonight, and I've had the people come in. I've yes, I did. Okay. I'd also like to thank the hotel. The hotel is really set. Food, it kind of had us in here close together. We weren't all spread.
Chase, Charlie. Alright, so Michael, push. Charlie, why don't you tell me about No, I don't. You just tell me
escort her in. And
You leave where that came from.
Hey, Charlie. Thank you.